A Body of Doctrinal Divinity, Book 3 of the External Works of God, Chapter 3 of The Creation of Man, narrated by David Clark, Part 1. Man was made last of all the creatures, being the chief and masterpiece of the whole creation on earth, whom God had principally and first in view in making the world, and all things in it, according to the known rule that what is first in intention is last in execution. God, proceeding in his works of artificers in their form, a less perfect to a more perfect work, till they came to what they have chiefly in view, a finished piece of work, in which they employ all their skill, and which, coming after the rest, appears to greater advantage. Man is a compendium of the creation, and therefore is sometimes called a microcosm, a little world, the world in miniature. Something of the vegetable, animal and rational world meet in him. Spiritual and corporal substance, or spirit and matter, are joined together in him. Yea, heaven and earth centre in him. He is the bond that connects them both together. All creatures were made for his sake, to possess, enjoy and have the dominion over, and therefore he was made last of all. And herein appear the wisdom of God, that all accommodations were readily provided for him, when he made the earth for his habitation, all creatures for his use, the fruits of the earth for his profit and pleasure, light, heat and air for his delight, comfort and refreshment, with everything that could be wished for and desired to make his life happy. Man was made on the sixth day and last day of the creation, and not before, nor were there any of the same species made before Adam, who is therefore called the first man, Adam. There have been some who have gone by the name Preadamites because they held that there were men before Adam. So Zabians held, and speak of one that was his master, and in the last century one Pierius wrote a book in Latin in favour of the same notion, which has been refuted by learned men over and over. It is certain that sin entered into the world and death by sin by one man, even the first man, Adam, from whom death first commenced and from whom it has reigned ever since. Now, if there were men before Adam, they must have been all alive at his formation. There had been no death among them. And if they had been of any long standing before him, as the notion suggests, the world, in all probability, was as much peopled as it may be now. And if so, why should God say, let us make man, when there must be a great number of men in being already? And what occasion was there for such an extraordinary production of men? Why was Adam formed out of the dust of the earth, and Eve out of one of his ribs, and these two coupled together, that the race of men might spring from them, if there were men before. But it is certain that Adam was the first man, and he is called not only with respect to Christ, the second Adam, but because he was the first of the human race, and the common parent of mankind, and Eve the mother of all living. That is of all men living. The Apostle Paul says that God has made of one blood, that is, of the blood of one man, all nations of men, to dwell on all the face of the earth. And this he said in the presence of the wise philosopher at Athens, who though they objected to the new and strange deities they suppose he introduced, yet said not one word against the account he gave of the origins of mankind. But what puts this out of all question with those that believe the divine revelation, is that it is expressly said that before Adam was formed, there was not a man to till the ground. Genesis 2.5 Man was made after and upon a consultation held concerning his creation. Let us make man, which is an address not to second causes, not to the elements, nor to the earth, for God could, if he would, have commanded the earth to have been brought forth at once, as he commanded it to bring forth grass, herbs, trees, and living creatures of all sorts, 
and not have consulted with it, nor is it an address to angels who were never God's privy counsel, nor was man made after their image, and he being corporal, they incorporal. But the address was made by Jehovah the Father too, and the consultation was held by him with the other two divine persons in the deity, the Son and Spirit, a like phrase used, see Genesis 3.22 and 11.7 and Isaiah 6.8, and such a consultation being held about the making of man as was not at the making of any of the rest of the creatures, shows what an excellent and finished piece of work God meant to make. Concerning the creation of man, the following things may be observed. 1. The author of his creation. God. So God created man, not man himself. A creature cannot create, and much less itself, nor angels, for then they would be entitled to worship from the man, which they have refused, because their fellow servants, and it might be added, their fellow creatures. But God, who is the creator of the ends of the earth, was the creator of the first man, and of all since, for we are all his offspring and therefore exhorted to remember our Creator, or Creators, for so it is in the original text. For as they were more concerned in the consultation about man's creation, so in the creation of him. And the same that were in the one were in the other, even Father, Son, and Spirit. Hence we read of God our Makers in various passages of the Scripture. Job 35.10, Psalm 149.2, Isaiah 44. 54 5 that God the Father who made the heavens and the earth and sea and all that in them are made man among the rest and peculiarly made him will not be questioned nor need there be any doubt about the Son of God since without him the eternal word was not anything made that was made then not man and if all things were made and created by him whether visible and invisible then man was made by him who must be reckoned among all the things. 1 John 1 to 3, Colossians 1 16. The character and relation of an husband to the church more particularly belongs to Christ and her husband is expressly said to be her maker. Isaiah 54 5. Compare with Psalm 95 6 to 8 and Hebrews 3 6 to 7. Nor is the Holy Spirit to be excluded from the formation of man who had a concern in the whole creation. Genesis 1.3, Job 26.13, Psalm 33.6, and to whom Elihu particularly ascribes his formation, Job 33.4, and why the first man made by him also. Yea, the act of breathing into man the breath of life when he became a living soul seems most agreeably to him the spirit and breath of God who has so great a concern in the recreation or, or renovation of man, even in his regeneration, whereas the three divine persons should be remembered as creators and be feared, worshipped and adored as such. And thanks be given them for creation, preservation and for all the mercies of life bountifully provided by them. It is pretty remarkable that the word created should be used three times in one verse where the creation of man is only spoken of, as it should seem to point out the three divine persons concerning therein. Genesis 1, 27. 2. The constituent and essential parts of man created by God, which are two, body and soul. These appear at his first formation. The one was made out of the dust, and the other was breathed into him. And so, at his dissolution, the one returns to the dust, for whence it was, and the other to God that gave it. And, indeed, death is no other than disillusion or disunion of these two parts. The body without the spirit is dead, the one dies, the other does not. First, the body, which is a most beautiful structure, and must appear so when it is considered, with what precision and exactness every part is formed for its proper use. Even every muscle, vein and artery, yea, the least fibre, and that every limb is set in its proper place to answer its designed end, and all in just symmetry and proportion, and 
in a subservancy to the use of each other and for the good of the whole. To enter into a detailed particular more properly belongs to an autonomy and that art is now brought to such a degree of perfection that by it most amazing discoveries are made in the structure of the human body as the circulation of the blood. So that it may even be said of our bodies as David said of his I am fearfully and wonderfully made Psalm 139 verse 14 the erect posture of the body is not to be omitted, which so remarkably distinguishes man from the four-footed animal who looked downwards to the earth and by which man is fitted and directed to look upwards to heaven, to contemplate them and the glory of God displayed in them, and even to look up to God above them, to worship and adore him, to praise him for mercies received and to pray to him for what are wanted, as well as instructs men to set their affections not on things on the earth but on things in heaven and indeed it is natural for every man whether in any great distress or when favoured with an unexpected blessing and when he receives tidings that surprise him whether of good or of bad things to turn his face upwards in the Greek language man has his name from turning and looking upwards. The body of man is very fair and beautiful for if the children man or Adam are fair as suggested in Psalm 45 2 then must certainly Adam himself was created fair and beautiful and something he had the name Adam given him from his beauty the root of the word in the Ethiopic language signifies to be fair and beautiful and though external beauty is a vain thing to gaze at and for men